Food combining, does it really work? Does it actually help your digestion? How to proper combine foods to optimal digestion and nutrition? What about the science of food combining? Is it a myth? Does it really work? And how to apply food combining to your daily living? Stay there until the end to learn more about how to combine foods to proper digestion, absorption, and assimilation to optimal nutrition. Do you want to know more about fasting and how to live a healthful life or even raw vegan recipes? Hygienic fasting, nature surgery, and the book Natural Delicacies, Cooking Without a Stove are available on Amazon and Hygienic Fasting is actually available on print on demand so you can receive it at your home. But I also have eight books published, six online courses, retreats here in Brazil, and I attend patients online in private sessions. Unfortunately, all the other books and the online courses are still only available in Portuguese. But if you want my help as a nutritionist, or even if you want to come to a retreat in Brazil, just sign up. The contact will be on the website and in the links below. And please don't forget to subscribe, hit the bell button for notifications, comment, share the video. If you do all those, you are going to help the channel to grow. If we grow, you grow together, getting more vital, life-changing information and help yourself and others to make this a more healthy and better planet for all of us. Hi, I'm Dr. Corassa, a clinical nutritionist from Brazil that have been living a natural hygiene lifestyle for almost 20 years. That means I have reversed a lot of diseases and have been living as healthy as I can for 20 years with fasting, sunshine, exercise, sleep, and diet, and a lot of other lifestyle factors that I try to incorporate and that not just healed me from diabetes, two surgeries, one, from, one in my back, one in my nose, a lot of respiratory issues, allergies, and intestinal problems as well. So I healed myself from a lot of diseases just by changing my lifestyle. And I'm passionate to share with you what you can do, simple lifestyle changes that you can apply in your daily living to live your fullest functional potential and health potential as well. So in hygiene, this science of health, this lifestyle medicine model that preaches a really healthy life, a really natural life. Natural hygienists talked a lot about food combining back in the days, almost 200 years ago. And let's talk a little bit about the science of food combining. I really love a quote from this Essen Gospel of Peace that says, don't cook or mix too much food unless you want your intestines to become like a swamp. Edmund Cizelekiel, the translator for the Essen Gospel of Peace. I really lo love this quote that is on the cover as well. Don't search for the laws in your scriptures because the law is life while what is written is dead. I think we can easily interpret this for our daily modern living and science. What Carl Sagan used to say, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. That means although we don't have science for food combining, it is the norm in nature. All animals, all creatures that live in nature eat one food at a time when they're hungry until they're full, until they're satiated. So no creatures in the planet mix their foods. If a chimpanzee comes down, finds a banana tree, he will eat bananas until he's satiated, until he goes walking around and find a, a tree of mango. But he not gather the mangoes and the bananas and walk for a few miles more and find lettuce and tomatoes and find other stuff and mix them all together in a dish, in a plate and feed himself. So when we mix foods, we have a hard time with digestion. So animals eat mono meals. So what I'm saying about this quote is, although we still don't have too much science on food combining, there is a lot of empirical evidence 
that you can see animals eating and you can feel in yourself when you try to eat a lot of different varieties in the same meal, a lot of mixed foods in the same meal, you don't digest as well and you don't feel as good when you don't mix anything and just eat a mono meal. So better than just trusting in science, try to trust in your own body and your own feelings and your own logical intuition as well. So the science of food combining starts with Pavlov more than a hundred years ago when he got the Nobel Prize winner for in physiology and medicine for what was called the conditioned reflex. Pavlov showed that dogs, just by his ringing a bell, they start the process of digestion. They start to secrete saliva and also digestive enzymes. So they were getting ready for the meal because they knew that was the time and that was the cue, the bell ringing. So Dr. Herbert Shelton, one of nature hygienist pioneers, he also tells a story in one of his lectures that scientists fed two dogs a lot of meat and finishing the meal, one was chained to a tree and what uh, the other dog was chained to a car. And the dog that was chained to a car kept running for a few hours behind the car while the other dog was just standing still and digesting. A few hours afterwards, they killed both dogs and the dog that was chained to the tree had completely digested his meal and the other dog, well, the meal was completely undigested. So you can see that digestion requires energy. So you have to stop, you have to rest to digest properly. And I think that's the first rule of digestion. Digestion requires energy, so if you want to digest properly your food, you should rest and not exercise. Yeah, for sure, Eduardo, uh, exercise after the meal reduces glycemia. I agree completely, but if you did the right thing in nature, that is to exercise before each meal and to sleep early, to have dinner early, to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, a lot of plant-based foods, to not be obese or sedentary, to get enough vitamin D, a lot of other lifestyle habits that are healthy contribute to glycemic control. So if you're not really in bad health and diabetic, you don't need to walk after the meal to try to reduce your glycemia because your glycemia will be where it should be, where we want it to be. And you don't have to try to do, you know, fix one thing causing another problem. That is to walk after the meal instead of just letting your body rest. That is what he's asking after each meal. So I love TC Fry quote also. What is the importance of the quantity of nutrients that we introduce in our bodies if we ingest it in such a form in such a way that we, we damage and overload the digestive system. This way, we compromise digestion because we fail to extract all the nutrients from what we eat. So, food combining actually starts with Dr. William Howard Hay, and it was called back then the Hay's diet. He was about to die because of a lot of health issues, and then he just adopted a natural hygiene diet without refined foods and healed himself. He advanced the research of Pavlov, creating a practical application of what physiologists have found in the lab. You can see here in this pyramid that he separated foods, protein foods, carbohydrate foods, acid foods, and fats, vegetables, and, and the, the other foods in the middle of the pyramid. So protein foods would be animal foods and also beans, lentils, etc. Acid foods and acids would be oranges or, for example, vinegar. And carbohydrates would be beans, rice, and also fruits. And you can see no, no, or yes, because it combines well with the other or, or doesn't. I love this quote from Dr. Herbert Shelton from his book, Food Combining Made Easy. Old Mother Nature never created a sandwich never turn out a sandwich. 
So food combining actually refers to foods that are compatible with their digestive chemistry. So physiologists recognize for over the century that the efficiency of digestion and the nutrition that an organism depends, a lot of this basis depends on the types of foods that we combine in a meal. So combining improperly would affect our health because it would affect digestion and then absorption and assimilation. Digestion is the process of breaking down the food in your stomach and intestines. Absorption is the process of absorbing through the microvilli that we have in our intestine that is connected with a lot of blood supply. So the nutrients are being absorbed in these villi. It's like fingers on our intestines that pass to the blood and then from the blood to the cell, it's called assimilation. So digestion, absorption that passes from the intestines to the blood and then from the blood to the cell that is assimilation. So proteins would need an acid median to be properly digested and carbohydrates would need an alkaline median. So all of us learn in biology when we are young that when we mix an alkaline substance and an acid substance, they both neutralize each other because you cannot have two different mediums in the same place. So it's the same for our stomach. The old hygienist would suggest that if you mix protein with carbohydrates, because proteins need an acid median and carbohydrates need alkaline median, the digestion of them would be slowed down, so it would end up causing damage to us. That means putrefaction and fermentation. Proteins putrefy, carbohydrates ferment. So that will cause not just indigestion, but bad undernutrition because fermentation and putrefaction would release a lot of toxic byproducts in our bloodstream, opening the way for diseases. So you have to understand that the digestive process is chemical, but also mechanical. The, the mechanical and the chemical process begin with the mouth, with the chewing of the food, but the insalivation, the salivary enzymes, you have even salivary amylase, the enzyme to break down starch, is actually already secreted in your mouth. World hygienists also paid attention to eating in a sequential manner. As Dr. Stanley Bass once said, there was a famous case described by William Belmont, a famous surgeon and father of the gastric physiology of a soldier damage with a shot during the United States Civil War. And this shot actually opened a hole in his belly that was visible, that made his intestine visible from the outside. So he, his digestion was studied for a, a period of time for, by several different medical doctors. They observed that the foods were digested in different levels. Uh, hygienists, because of that, would suggest for people to eat in a sequential manner. That means I'm going to eat bananas, mangoes, and lettuce for this meal. So I'm going to eat just the mangoes and then the bananas and then the lettuce. That means we eat the most rapid food and most watery food first and then the least watery food, the most dense food afterwards. Uh, for example, we then start a meal with fruits and then vegetables and then the nuts. For sure, you don't need that. It's just a, a matter of perspective, but I already went for two months without mixing any food whatsoever, just eating with my hands. And for sure, I felt the better, best digestion. I felt the best control in terms of hunger. You know, you know exactly when to stop or, or how much you need to eat when you're satisfied. So I really felt different and I felt better. Not, not mixing my food, eating with my hands, even my vegetables. But for sure, that is a little bit harder to do every day. But we can understand that the foods more rich in water digest more rapidly the foods less rich in water digest more slowly so we can follow this pattern. Leave the nuts and seeds 
for the last part of the meal and eat the fruit first or eat the vegetables first and then the fruit and then the, the fats. So look at my plates a few years ago. I, I just harvest mangoes, plantains, a finger bananas, like gold bananas that we call here, the really small and sweet bananas, mulberries, peanut butter fruits, okra, jackfruit. That plate was a blast. I actually had Cuban bananas on, my, on the ground on that picture. You can see the, the bananas on the, the corner of the picture. So that was really a blast. And I love to mix fruits during a meal but not, not make a fruit salad. I, I actually eat one at a time in a sequential manner instead of making all of them a fruit salad and eat it at once. But I recognized, and I, I'm showing this picture for you to understand that I can do mono meals, but I usually don't do mono meals because I like to try different fruits. Sometimes I prefer to eat what is most ripe so I don't lose any fruits in my kitchen. It depends, right? But I recognize that animals eat one food at a time when they're hungry until they're full. And some animals don't just do mono meals. They have mono diets, like the carnivores. They eat meat today, they eat meat tomorrow, meat in the next week, in the next year, in the next year. They eat meat, 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 and more meat. So if you think about it, it's not that easy. If you think about it, it's not that complicated. It's not that strange to eat mono meals, for example. If there's animals living in mono diets, like for example, the cow, she eats grass today, grass tomorrow, grass the next week, and grass the next month. She lives on a diet of grass, for sure. Maybe she changes a little bit of the grass that she eats, but she doesn't vary too much food. And human beings need a great variety of foods. Chimpanzees, for example, eat 130 varieties of food along the year, according to primatologists. But we don't focus on variety for each meal, but variety comes along the year. So I love the hygienist adage, variety, simplicity at each meal, variety throughout the year. So variety will come in nature uh, in each season, in each month that passes, in each week. Each week that passes that has new fruits coming available in nature. But it's not each meal that what people are usually consuming, you know, like rice, beans, potatoes, meat, eggs, just orange juice, and a cake in the end. There's a lot of variety going on on people's plates, but they are not focusing on fresh food and really big variety because they mix like seven, eight or 10 foods at a time in one day, but they end up not getting enough variety throughout the year. When I was omnivore, I used to eat rice, beans, meat, potato, chicken, eggs, milk, and pasta. That was pretty much it. You know, I, I didn't set too much variety. Most of my days, most of my 22 years of cooked food was just that variety. And with a raw food diet, that's one of the blessings. With a plant-based diet and even more in a raw food diet, you start to look a lot more for a variety of colors, of plants, of smells and tastes and textures. So variety is key for good nutrition, but along the year, not every day. And Excessive variety for each meal is the key to gluttony. The old hygienists used to say a lot that if you have a lot of variety at one meal, you tend to overeat. And now we're seeing the scientific research coming out that shows that if you have a lot of variety, you tend to overeat and gain weight. So if you are in an all-you-can-eat buffet and you had enough, but somebody comes with a new dessert, you are always like, oh, let me try just a little bit. You know, you have, you, you want to take a, a bite of each different stuff. So try to get variety along the year to not overeat. The less we mix different food items and the less varieties we utilize, more efficiently we digest and less tempted we are to eat more than we need. On the contrary, the more variety the more the tendency to overeat, Dr. Stanley Bass. So what are the factors for a good digestion? 
People don't understand that digestion doesn't depend only on food combining. Good digestion depends on several different factors that are really overlooked or underestimated by the medical profession in general or the public or the lay public. So if you think about it, even Ayurveda, the old Indian medicine, used to say that the digestive fire. So to exercise is to open our digestive fire, if you think about it. It's like a car. If you fill your tank, gas tank of your car, and you stop on your garage to sleep, and you go out in the next day to work, and you just by starting your car, what do you do? You try to fill up your tank again, but it will spill gasoline. You do throw a lot of gasoline out of the tank. So it's the same thing for your body. You fed yourself three, four, five square meals in a day, a lot more than you need. You're already overweight and you go to sleep, you wake up, you don't exercise. And as soon as you wake up, what do you do? You eat again and you eat again and you eat again. So that causes poor digestion. What you have to understand is that to have perfect digestion, for us hygienists, you have to exercise before each meal. Like animals always do in nature, animals in nature exercise before each meal. Why? Because they need to. There's no supermarket to buy the food, there's no shelves, there's no refrigerators. You have to run, you have to climb trees, you have to fight predators, you have to walk or swim for miles until you find your next meal. So factors for good digestion is exercise is an important factor for good digestion. You, you notice, you, you can have your own empirical experience that you, you notice that every time you exercise before a meal, you feel a lot better. You feel a lot easier to digest. Health in general is also a good parameter for digestion. You can see that a lot of sick people don't digest their food well. What they say, I cannot digest anything. Anything I eat turns to gas. And that is actually true. When you don't have health, your digestive system doesn't work properly because the body doesn't have enough energy to send to the digestive system to digest, but also to the repairing systems to repair. That's why we lose hunger when we are not healthy. That's why we have the indication for fasting when we are not in optimal health. You want to learn more about fasting, I highly recommend you to read, read Hygienic Fasting, Nature Surgery. My book that is already translated to English is available on Amazon, on print on demand and Kindle. So you can understand why the golden rule of hygiene is when you're not comfortable in mind and body, miss one or more meals until the comfort comes back again. So I, this is the most updated and comprehensive book on fasting out there. I'm pretty sure you find amazing and the best information you can have on fasting in the world right now. So health in general, that means if you're not digesting right now, probably you're not, you haven't been taking care of your health and your digestion for years and years. So you're not really hungry to natural food. If you're not really hungry to natural food, you're probably not, you're probably needing a fast to give your digestive system a rest. It's like an organ. Your digestive system is like, your digestive system is like going to the gym. What do you do? You go to the gym and lift weights with your shoulders and biceps today. And the next day you give a rest to your shoulders and biceps and do legs. Why? Because the overload causes the body to need a rest. So every time you are overloading your digestive system with a lot of food ends up causing your body to need 
over rest, a big rest because you cause it a big stress. So if you eat fruits and vegetables, the digestive system is happier. It's so easy for the digestive system to work on these fruits and vegetables that it, it can digest again in really near future. Other factor that is actually a severe underestimated in good digestion is chrononutrition and chronobiology. Your biological clock that is in your brain controls the other clocks in the other organ, organs and systems. So there is a time to digest food. And this time during the period that the sun is up, when the sun is down, the, the organism is, is adapted throughout evolution. His biology was adapted to rest and not to digest. If you eat during the night, the digestion will be poor and will interfere with your sleep and the regeneration process and also the repair process that goes in your intestine to become ready again to digest. You have to pay attention to chronobiology for good digestion. And you also have to pay attention for chrononutrition to digestion. If you think about it, as soon as you wake up, you shouldn't be eating. You should be at least giving an hour or two for your digestive system to start to feel hungry. And also before dinner and also at night, if you're trying to eat late at night, you're not going to digest well. Why? Because there's changes in cortisol and melatonin that actually causes not that we know that causes the pancreas to not produce properly insulin, but also we will be finding for sure in the near future data that interferes with the process of digestion, the digestive juices that comes from the pancreas as well. So if you want to digest optimal, you have to be eating noon will be the perfect digestion for your intestines, that's for sure. And also we have to pay attention for foods that are biological adapted to us. That means we throughout evolution have been eating primarily fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. So these foods have become more adapted to our bodies because our DNA actually adapts to what we have been doing throughout evolution. If you think about it a lot, but a lot, I think everybody relates to having gas after eating beans. Beans, lentils, chickpeas, any kind of beans ends up causing gases because there's two carbohydrates in beans that causes stectosis and raffinosis that actually are oligosaccharides. These oligosaccharides, that means several kinds of monosaccharides connected together. Polysaccharides, oligosaccharides, they are complex carbohydrates and they are too complex for our digestive system to digest. So we don't have the proper enzymes for these beans so we end up having gases when we try to digest them. So what I'm talking about foods that are biological adapted to us digest better is fruits and vegetables. You can try, you can, you can see empirically, eat fruits and vegetables and see how long it does it take to digest and how little upset it causes to your stomach. But when you try to digest other stuff, you see that it's heavy, it's tough. So you get the perspective. The more water that is in the food, the easier that is to digest. The more natural it is to us, the closer to a fruit and a vegetable, that is, the easier it is to digest it. So being emotionally stable during a meal is also really important because stress affects our digestive system. You actually probably have maybe lost a loved one or maybe broke up a relationship, or maybe lost your job, or have any kind of stress, you've been robbed, you, you pass through a life and death situation, and what does it happen? Your stomach shuts down immediately and takes a few hours to come back. Why? Because processing emotions is also energy demanding. So the body just turns to what is most important at the moment, and when you are under stress, the most important is to process the stress, to process the information, to deal with the situation 
before coming back to eat again because you have body fat reserves. The body's not like, oh, now it's time to eat because it understands that it's, you know, it's not miss a meal, miss a few hours without eating will not cause any harm, will actually be beneficial. I love a quote from Dr. Weger, an old hygienist, that used to say, you are either poised or poisoned. Emotionally poised, he meant. So in digestion, I love this quote from Dave Klein, the byproducts of putrefaction are highly harmful. They include methane, hydrogen sulfide, mercaptans, which give off the rotten egg odor when excreted with methane gas, cadaverine, putrescine, ammonia, indole, escatol, and several other toxic and carcinogenic gases and substances. Just as hydrogen sulfide breaks down concrete, metal, and steel sewer pipes, it will irritate and destroy the flesh inside your intestines and colon. So when we don't digest the food properly, it ends up providing our blood with toxic byproducts that are actually even carcinogenic, as he said. I never checked the data actually, but for sure those smelly, stinky gases and the feeling that you have after a meal that is not properly digested, that causes bloating and gases and eructations and reflux, you know, and the, the poop comes out like really with a foul smell, it is actually terrible. It's actually vile. And you can think that it's not actually good and beneficial for your body. So we have to think, we have to always reflect about the process of digestion and how it interferes with our health. So what are the main causes of indigestion? Excess food, that is more calories than you can process at the moment because when the person is sick he cannot digest too much food when the person is well when the person is exercising several different factors can influence the capacity for digestion for example women always eat a lot less than men so they can digest less calories than men that's for sure also bad food combining and too much variety in each meal will for sure cause indigestion. You can improperly combine two or three foods, but if you eat 10 foods, even though they are properly combined, they will not digest well. A weakening of our digestive system. If you're not healthy, your digestive system, the fire of your digestive system will be also weak. So nothing will digest well when your digestive system is not functioning properly. And if you're not digesting properly, the nutritive process is also damaged. The nutrients will not be getting into your bloodstream and in your cells. Not paying attention to the act of eating. When you're feeding, you have to pay attention to the food you're eating. That means eat without heal hunger, without the physiological necessity for food, for distraction, for socializing, for emotional upset, that means you not just have to pay attention to the food instead of watching a movie, but you also shouldn't eat for recreational purpose, but for a physiological demand that we call hunger. And also a lack of physical exercises every day. The creation of the demand and the stimuli for digestion. You probably even heard about it the peristalsis that happens in your intestines depends on physical activity. For example, to go to the bathroom, to take a crap, to, to defecate, you need exercise because it helps with the process of digestion. And also helps with the process of kneading the food once again and to putting the food outside of your body. So if you don't stimulate for the food to go outside of the body, how are you going to get more food again? So exercise helps in both ways. And also taking liquids during your meals. And you can see by yourself, eat a really heavy, huge meal and try to drink fluids afterwards or during the meal, like half of a liter of coconut water after 20 bananas. 
I feel that, you know, it causes somewhat indigestion. I don't like to drink meal. I don't like to drink during the meals or after the meals, just before the meals or a few hours afterwards, if I need it. But fruits, vegetables, and our natural diet of Eden is so rich in water that you actually don't feel the need for water. So you can take a look at this. The pancreas is actually connected to the stomach because there's actually capillaries, the blood vessels that are connected for the insulin to go through. And there's also the production of digestive enzymes. And there's the Langham's islets that are actually, they produce the glucagon and insulin to help with the process of nutrition. These digestive enzymes are really important to break down the food, but most people never heard of them. So every time you hear a word that ends with an ase, it's actually an enzyme. Proteases, lipases, amylases, they're all digestive enzymes. Amylases are enzy digestive enzymes for starch, for what we call, for example, in Portuguese, it's called amido. So that's why amylases, probably from the Greek and Latin. And also there's proteases because of protein, with an ACE. Proteases, that is the enzymes that breaks down proteins. And lipases from lipids. So amylase, it breaks down polysaccharides into disaccharides and in, then into monosaccharides. Our bodies can only utilize monosaccharides, that is glucose and fructose. The cells of our bodies can only use micronutrients. It cannot use macronutrients. So micronutrients can only utilize macronutrients. When we eat the food, for example, rice and beans, there is macro carbohydrates. So it has to be breaking down through the process that we call hydrolysis. The breaking down with water. The, the body uses water and these digestive enzymes to set it free, all these glucose stuck together in a huge ring of complex carbohydrates. So it ends up with single rings that we call monosaccharides, and then it can get absorbed and go to the bloodstream because the absorption side is also really, really tight. It should be tight for sure. If you have leaky gut syndrome, your intestine will be too permeable. It will be passing stuff through there. That's one of the parts on fruits that are actually simple carbohydrates because when they are in the tree, they are complex carbohydrates. For example, banana. You see the green banana, you cannot eat it. We are not pigs with high quantities of amylase to digest complex carbohydrates. But when it gets ripe, the food digesting itself for us to not make the work, for us to not spend energy or digestive enzymes to break down that food. So why not eat the fuel ready for us instead of cooking the fuel to be able to eat it? For example, why to eat a potato when you can eat a fruit that is already ready to eat? What other subjects would you want to view here? Do you want to know more? Please comment below. Don't forget to share the video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell for notifications. And if you want to help our work and help yourself, two of my 10 books are already translated and published in English on Amazon. And Hygienic Fasting Nature Surgery is actually available print on demand also. And Natural Delicacies Cooking Without a Stove, it's on Kindle. So if you want my help, the link below for the website and for the WhatsApp contact, you can get a consultation, retreats, online courses, and read all the books. It's life-changing information for the most updated lifestyle information out there in the planet. So the beautiful part of the fruit that you don't need to cook it. It will cook for the sun will be cooking the fruit for us in the tree and making it ripe, making it ready for us. So there is also the proteases that break down these peptide bonds into polypeptides, into depeptides, into peptides. So it's breaking down several parts through pepsin, desaminases, transaminases, proteinases, 
and a hydrochloric acid. The digestion of proteins begins in the stomach, different from the digestion of fats and starch. And the lipases breaks down the glycerides into free fatty acids and glycerol. So this is a, a, a chart of food combining for you to understand. This is a chart of foods for you to understand the category in, we, in each food of each food that goes into each category. For example, the pineapple, the orange, the lime, the tangerine, they are acid fruits. The semi-acid fruits would be the guava, the apple, the papaya, the mango, the pear, and peaches. And then there's the sweet fruits, like the bananas, the persimmons, the cherry moya, the figs, the jackfruit, the dates. And then in the vegetables, you have the tender vegetables, like and celery. But in the fruit vegetables, you have like the zucchini, the bell pepper, a cucumber, because they're all fruits. They are no sweet fruits. So they have seeds in them, but people think that they are vegetables, but they are not vegetables. They are vegetable fruits. And they are also the fatty fruits, like the avocado, the breadfruit, the coconuts. And there's also the rich in water fruits, idric fruits, that we call the melons, and the watermelon, they were suggested by the old hygienists to be eaten separately from all other fruits because they digest so fast. And for sure, di watermelon doesn't digest as well with a banana. But if you are sick, you have to pay a lot more attention to these details when you are well. For example, back, back in the days, if I ate like bananas with watermelons, I would feel terrible. But nowadays, I almost don't feel anything, for sure. It counts, I do think it counts, but I think as the more healthy you are, the stronger you are, the better digestion you are, the least you have to worry with these small food combining details. There are the starches like grains, legumes, pumpkins, tubers, and there's the proteins, vegetable proteins and then animal proteins. The eggs, the meat, the milk, nuts, the seed, beans, the legumes, the chickpea, the peas, etc. And there are the fats, mar margarine, butter, and the vegetable oils. I don't recommend any of them. If you look at the internet, you will find a lot of charts of food combining, old charts. But I have created my own when I, when I wrote my first book, Frugal Uncooking, Recipes from Paradise. I created a whole chapter on food combining. This book hasn't been translated to English yet, but Nature's Delicacy, Uncooking Without a Stove, and is available on Amazon. You can get it on Kindle over there to get a hand on my recipes. But a whole chapter on this book about food combining, and this is the chart that I have created for it. Because if you are eating a frugivore diet, you can make it these food charts, food combining charts, way more easy. For example, I just separated melons, then acid fruits combined with semi-acid fruits, semi-acid fruits and acid fruits combined with melons, then the sweet fruits only combined with vegetables or semi-acid fruits and the fats, and then the complex carbohydrates. But vegetables combine pretty well with anything. So I think that would be the most appropriate food combining for raw vegans, but still, as I said, food combining is not as important as a lot of things that people underestimate, like intense exercise, paying attention to proper sleep, proper chronobiology, chrononutrition, uh, sleep hygiene, uh, sunshine, a huge quantity of allergies to foods ends completely when the supposed allergic individuals learn to, to eat the foods in proper digestible combinations. What they suffer, it's not allergy as they think, but indigestion. The allergy is the name given to protein poisoning. Normal digestion derives nutrients and not poisons to the, the blood supply. Proteins completely digested will not be deleterious substances, will not be harmful substances. Dr. Herbert Shelton. That's a quote from him. So almost to end, for us to realize what have been said here and for us to reflect, look at this scientific article on primatology. The American Journal of Primatology, uh, scientists were analyzing the diets of primates. 
results support the argument that chimpanzees are ripe fruit specialists. Nigogo chimpanzees ate a broad, mostly fruit-based diet, feeding time devoted to fruit varied positively with fruit availability and diet diversity and varied inversely with fruit availability. That means that, like chimpanzees, we are anthropoid primates. We are made for fruits and vegetables, and that's why we see the spectrum, full spectrum of colors, the capacity to sense the sweet taste, the opposable thumbs. We are biological made to find fruits in nature and to eat them. So that's why chimpanzees are suggested by the scientists as ripe fruit specialists. They are always looking for ripe fruit to eat because unripe fruit, we cannot eat it. It's not tasty, it's not pleasurable because the plants wanted us to eat the ripe fruits because the seed would be ready for reproduction. That means the plant's child would be ready to go to the ground and create new plants, new trees. So the plants are really smart and they only make the fruit available to us when the seed is right, ready to grow a new tree. And we want the sweet. The sweet make us feel good. So it's a symbiosis that was developed throughout millions of years that we cannot change right now. People think they can change cooking their food and things like that. No, you end up reducing your lifespan and reducing your health span. We, we are ripe fruit specialists, as the, uh, anthropo uh, the primatologist suggests. And they devote more time to eating fruits with, when there's fruit around, but when fruit is not around, they end up eating any other kind of stuff. And as they suggest, they love figs. And there's more chimpanzees than Nigogo because there's higher abundance of fresh fruits. That, that is a really important thing. Human beings have grown so much because we managed to grow a lot of food, a lot of starch that is caloric dense. But fruit also can be our main staple if there is fruit around. And human beings are doing what? They are eating processed food, grains, and they are not eating the foods that are biological adapted to them. That's why there's not too many fruits around because to be fruit trees around, we have to be eating fruits and defecating and spilling out the seeds. So if we all, the eight billions of human beings would be eating a lot of fruit nowadays, there would be a lot more fruit trees around for all of us to feed. Leaves, when primates don't have enough fresh fruit available, they have fallback foods. They end up, fall, the, the main fallback foods for them are leaves. And look at what they talk about the chimpanzees. Highly frugivorous primates. That means animals that live primarily on fruits and vegetables. So the primates are not just frugivores. They don't eat just fruits and vegetables. Yeah, for sure, they can eat a little bit of meat, they can eat a little bit of seeds and any other stuff, but fruits and vegetables are the predominant foods. So to conclude the lecture would be food combining is a part of good nutrition. Although there's a lot of other factors that influentiate good digestion like health influences, physical activity, chrononutrition and chronobiology, emotional equilibrium. So you, you want to be well-nourished. You have to pay attention to all the lifestyle factors. It's not just the food. If you are underslept, you don't absorb and assimilate the nutrients well. There's scientific research showing that you will be undernourished if you are underslept and there's nothing about the food you can do about it. So don't think that nutrition is food. Nutrition is lifestyle. It's health related. It's not just food related. For sure, the food matters, matters. If it's organic, there's more nutrients than, the, than conventional food. If it's ripe food, if the food was properly picked in the in its right stage, we will have more nutrients. But to get the nutrients into your blood stream and into your cells is not just the food you eat. It's the whole lifestyle and the health of the organism. So just to finish, remember, you are not what you eat. You are what you eat, digest, absorb, and assimilate. And to finish with Herbert Shelton's quote, the wider the bread, the sooner you're dead. 
and that coat is like perfect because the more you refine the food, the worse your health is. So the longer the shelf life, the shorter yours. Choose well. And I have a challenge for you. I challenge you to try for a week or maybe a month or maybe even more than that to adopt a natural hygiene lifestyle. You have been living your whole life a normal way of life for what? 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, cooking your food, eating a lot of industrialized food, being sedentary, being overweight, sleeping late, eating late, not getting enough sunshine, not spending time in nature, and you are having probably terrible results or else you probably will not be here watching this channel trying to find healthy information. So I ask of you, are you going to lose a lot if you stay just one week without cooking food, without cooked food? Why not for a week, maybe for days, and maybe for a week or maybe even longer, a month, to eat a lot more raw foods, to eat a lot more fruits and vegetables, to ditch processed foods and to exercise, sleep early, uh, get some sunshine, just for a month. If you don't like the results, if you're not feeling like you're in the Garden of Eden, if you're not feeling like paradise, feeling the best you ever had in your whole life, you can come back to cooked food. People will still be cooking their foods tomorrow, next day, next year, next 10 years. I don't think human beings will stop cooking in any near future whatsoever, but are you going to wait for everybody to change so you can change or you're going to reap the benefits right now? It's up to you. It's always this. I have found my way and I haven't cooked my food for 20 years and I'm happy about it. Yeah, for sure. I ha have I ate something steamed? For sure. I have ate something steamed all these years. Do I maybe heat it with a, a, a dehydrator or even a pan for 30 seconds, a minute? Yeah, for sure. I have done that a few times, but most of the time, 99% of the time, I'm eating raw fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds and plant foods and sleeping early, exercising, having dinner early and living a healthy life. So it's up to you. But the consequences are always on your body as well. So choose wisely and if you like the video, don't forget to subscribe, hit the bells button for notification, comment below and give it a thumbs up. And also, if you want to support our channel, there are 10 books published, but only two already translated to English. But the other eight are in Portuguese. There's six online courses, all in Portuguese, but there's retreats every January, February and July here in MySpace in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. So you can learn the science of raw foods, the application, the science behind lifestyle medicine, how to make gourmet raw foods. And also I help patients with consultations online and also in private sessions. If you want it, just click the link below and I'll be glad to help you out. Don't forget if you like it, there are, there are also other videos here in the description uh, with the same content and also click these videos to know more.